They were a hardy people, these first settlers of Jackson County. From early 1830 through those first few years, they built cabins and cleared land in what was called the howling wilderness of the Michigan Territory. But not all of those early settlers were able to persevere and prosper. Some fell prey to illness, isolation, poverty. The cruel certainty of those days was that the vulnerable had no safety net, not one comparable to our modern systems. As early as March of 1834, according to a county history, there were individuals so poor that the county had to provide for them. At that time, the names of two sufferers were mentioned and accounts for their maintenance presented. In January of 1839, this was reported. Board of Superintendents of the Poor was appointed, composed of W.R. DeLand of Jackson, Thomas Cotton from Napoleon, and Elihu M. Gold from Parma. The first county poorhouse came out of an 1839 resolution which read, in view of the resolution abolishing the distinction between town and county poor, the board is of opinion that it is necessary and expedient to carry into effect the provisions of law in regard to the erection of a county poorhouse. Therefore, it is resolved that the superintendents of county poor are hereby authorized to purchase for the use of the county a tract of land not exceeding 320 acres and to erect one or more suitable buildings for the reception and accommodation of the county poor. By 1881, when a history of Jackson County was published, a large poor house was in place. The house is a long brick structure, two stories high, with an L in which are the kitchen and women's dining room. We pass through a long hall, opening from either side of which are the sleeping rooms of the women. The men sleep upstairs. All these rooms are marked by great cleanliness and the inmates are clean and neat in their personal appearance. But that description was not all that a reporter found in that same era. He wrote of his visit to the facility, sitting on the steps of a back enclosure sits a woman, clad in a stout blue frock, for she has a prejudice against clothes and frequently destroys them. She is bareheaded and seems to enjoy a sunbath. She is insane, not violently so as a rule, but seems to have lost all sense of human nature. She is intensely filthy, and her habits are decidedly more animally natural than humanly decent, and none of the other inmates will associate with her. In the 1881 history, the number of poor home residents was reported to be 33, a mixture of men and women. For men able to work, they were assigned chores on the farm, the garden, the barn, and the woodpile. Women had lighter work within the house. The farm contained 160 acres at that time, nearly all of it under cultivation. A tragic fire. Five years after that county history provided details of the poor home and farm, a devastating tragedy occurred. Early one Sunday morning in the dead of winter, January 24, 1886, a fire broke out. In the sensational journalism of that era, the Jackson Daily Citizen proclaimed the next day, poor paupers perish. Five unfortunates cremated at the county farm. The Daily Citizen went on to report that the night was intensely cold and the scenes of terror and suffering among the unfortunate inmates, beggars description. The reporter found only a mass of crumbling walls and tall chimneys reaching high into the crisp frosty air while within the quadrangle was an unrecognizable, compact, smoldering heap of bent iron rods, bars, crumbled tin, iron hoops, broken staves, roasted vegetables, and debris of indistinguishable forms, the whole permeated by a ghastly, sickening odor of burnt human flesh, so revolting and horrible that even the hardest face blanched in its presence and was impelled to turn in horror from the spot. In the weeks that followed, Jackson County's tragic fire alerted many other towns and counties to their vulnerability. A number of communities took steps to improve fire safety at their poor homes. Jackson County officials quickly began the task of rebuilding their poor home. When completed, that handsome structure stood well past the midpoint of the 20th century. During those decades, many improvements strengthened the safety net for the poor and indigent, both locally and nationally. 
The Roosevelt years brought Social Security, then came Medicare and Medicaid, plus the Americans with Disabilities Act in the last half of the 20th century. In the mid-1960s, county officials closed the poorhouse and farm. Increasingly, the role of the county was focusing on the health of the elderly and handicapped. So, in 1962, residents were transferred to a new Jackson County medical care facility on Lansing Avenue. The poor home property was sold and the building slated for demolition. During that process, it caught fire and burned down the night of April 23, 1967. Since then, only the old poor home cemetery has remained of what once was a major county facility along County Farm Road. In recent years, there has been renewed interest in the history of the poor home, its adjacent farm, and the old cemetery. Two county officials have figured in this era of rediscovery. One was Commissioner Vern Webster, who took it upon himself to maintain the premises of the cemetery for several years. More recently, Commissioner David Elwell took a fresh approach. As a member of the Blackman Township Local Development Finance Authority, he became aware that the old cemetery is now part of a larger parcel of land acquired by the township from the Jenkins family for development purposes. He began sharing the significance of the cemetery grounds with township officials, and recently commitments were made to maintain and highlight its historic significance. Finally, in the spring of 2022, the Jackson County, Michigan Historical Society took the lead in placing a county historic marker at the cemetery. Linda Haas, current president, arranged for a county historical marker to be installed and applied for a state marker. The township created an adjacent parking area for visitors. New signage was created and work was done to prepare the grounds as a park in development. A formal dedication took place on May 14, 2022. State legislators, county and township officials, plus historical society representatives participated in the event. Music was provided by Northwest High School musicians. There was even a formal reading of Will Carleton's famous poem, Over the Hill to the Poor House, by Commissioner Earl Poleski. There are also long-term plans for improvement. For instance, while more recent records have identified those buried at the cemetery, Older records were lost in the 1886 fire. Research has come up with 68 names, and officials would like to post those names on a monument or other marker at the site. Since the precise location of burial sites was never recorded, at times, grave diggers unearthed corpses already buried. To what end are these efforts expended? If it is true that not a sparrow can fall without the knowledge of its creator, of how much greater value are those poor souls who inhabit the poor farm cemetery. They may have been buried without ceremony or marker, but shouldn't their story be told? The old graveyard is a door to an important part in Jackson County's history. In that place is the knowledge of how this community cared for residents who were unable to care for themselves. And it is a reminder that every generation has the responsibility to care for those who are unable to care for themselves. In that light, the cemetery is also a memorial. We remember those who were buried alone in this world, poor and indigent, abandoned by their families. They deserve to be remembered, and this is the place for that solemn remembrance.